Nick and I hope to speak for about uh, 20 or 30 minutes to introduce you to um, holistic approaches to concurrent disorders. And we're hoping to address environmental factors, psychosocial factors, as well as medical factors to uh, support our clients with concurrent disorders. Um, and then we hope to have a group discussion with everyone for the remaining of, um, remainder of the hour. So um, thank you and please, yes, do share your questions uh, in the chat box. Um, so uh, we are speaking you, to you today from the Quiquitlam First Nation. Uh, that is where um, we are located uh, at the Redfish Healing Center. And so uh, we're very grateful to be able to um, share our, um, our findings and our design of our, our site uh, from the Coquitlam First Nation. So um, I'll start by showing you a little bit about our site, kind of giving you guys a virtual tour um, and highlighting how some of these things, um, these elements and design elements support recovery for our clientele. Um, we hear, um, and uh, for those who don't know, redfish is actually the translation of the term Quiquitlam. So that is why we, uh, where we got our name from. We've been open for uh, just a bit over a year. We were previously the Burnaby Center for Mental Health and Addiction. And so um, some of you guys are, are familiar with our previous site. We are currently at uh, 105 beds across seven units, and I can describe the different mandates of the seven units. And we are a designated mental health facility. Um, average length of stay may range from a few weeks up to um, um, several months. I think our average length of stay is about three months. Um, this is a, a picture of our site. Um, um, for those of you who don't know, um, many people are familiar with the term Riverview Grounds. Uh, that is no longer the name of the Riverview Grounds. It is actually called Samiqua Ella. So the, that's the large um, uh, parkland um, that we are on next door to PAC and, and some other sites as well. So if you ever get a chance to come visit, please do so. Um, Here's some, a, a little bit of an inside tour of our site. This is our um, smudging room, our healing community. Uh, we do run groups in here and there's airflow control for us to do indoor smudges. Um, and so we have um, trauma-informed and indigenous um, design elements throughout our entire building, um, highlighting um, kind of our roots. And this is the uh, healing community um, um, hummingbird room where we run quite a bit, of, a bit of our groups. Zooming out a little bit, you can imagine um, that our site is characterized by seven units and then common areas where our clients can attend programming. This is uh, an example of a unit of 15 beds. This right here, hopefully you can see my mouse, uh, is the care team base right at the center where nurses are able and staff are able to view both hallways with good lines of sight. Um, to the 17, uh, 15 beds, single rooms, uh, single bathrooms within each room. And then we have common areas for group room, family visitor room, dining area, as well as an outdoor locked but open air patio for each of the seven units. Here's what it looks like from the care team base down one of the hallways with the uh, dining area to your right and the care team base to our left. Um, here's another um, look of um, on the left, there's an open care team base where clients can come up and speak with the staff. And then to your extreme left, um, there is also a closed nursing area where charting and the med room is also located in there. Uh, dining area, and you can also see the patio on the right. Um, stepping outside of the unit, we also, as I mentioned, have a healing community, and that is where clients attend programming, um, therapy such as uh, CBT, DBT, as well as uh, recreational groups. We have a gym, um, fitness center down here, music room, kitchen, art room. In the middle of the screen, there's a kind of a big lounge with a giant TV for our movie nights. So um, clients who are have passes outside of their unit are able to come here um, for most of the day, as long as they're staff in. And our staff work, I think, from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. So for most of the day, this is an open space for the clients. And then stepping out of um, the building, this is kind of a bird's eye view of the outdoor space. Um, the, these were kind of the blueprints, but basically we are surrounded by um, two healing gardens um, and walking paths. And this is just a kind of a tiny um, section of the Samiqua Ella lands, which is much larger. 
So I'll speak quickly about um, our mandate and our population, and Nick will go into more detail about this a bit later. Um, we serve uh, adults with serious mental illness and substance use, so it's concurrent disorders. And one of the admission uh, criteria is that they've exhausted all of the local resources within their local communities um, at the level of the, of the individual health authorities. So then we receive referrals. Uh, almost all of our clients have um, significant histories of um, poverty, homelessness, trauma, adverse childhood experiences, and they are high consumers of um, the medical system, including rep repeated emergency visits. Um, we, I'll show you later how referrals are made, um, but we have a liaison with each of the health authorities who triages their clients. Each health authority has a number of beds and they triage their priority, usually um, from directly from community or hospital. And then we coordinate an admission and we always ensure there's a discharge plan back to the home health authority as well. So there's continuity of care. Um, I've kind of mentioned that we have seven units. Um, three of those units are more acute and often um, they're locked until a client gets a pass to leave the unit. We do have on unit programming. So um, you don't have to leave the unit to go to the healing community for groups. They're on, on unit groups. Our enhanced care unit is um, highly staffed and for individuals who may be contemplative for wanting treatment, many um, certified clients. Uh, locked unit in the enhanced care unit, and we provide specialized programming focusing on motivational enhancement. Um, we also have two assessment and stabilization units. These are where we intake uh, the majority of our clients, and we have a mix of um, people who are voluntary as well as certified clients. After folks have spent some time and stabilized in one of these three units, they move on to our treatment units. Um, we have four. Uh, three of them are standard treatment units, and one of them is catered more towards addressing cognitive impairment. So we don't accept significant severe cognitive impairment, but it often comes alongside concurrent disorders. So we have specialized programming to address that. Um, here's a kind of a flow map through the journey. So for, for those of you who might be interested in how um, referrals are made and what happens, um, some of these acronyms aren't right, so I'll just try to talk through it. Um, the green is what our local health authorities do, so like Vancouver Coastal and um, VHA and Interior Health and our, all of our partners. They are the ones who identify their own clients in their regions for um, candidacy for our program. And they will determine, because we have two pathways, people can go through the enriched um, or enhanced care unit. Um, where there's higher levels of secure, uh, secure um, more, more pre-contemplation. And so there's kind of, um, kind of a, a, a unit for some of the more um, severe uh, clients can go through an uh, enhanced care unit. And then we have our standard pathway where they go directly to one of the assessment and stabilization units. Uh, for those clients who go to um, enhanced care unit, sometimes that's th what they need is that um, a, a, up to a month of treatment in the enhanced care unit, and then they go back to their home health authorities. But oftentimes um, those clients are ending up being eligible for our um, standard pathway, and then they will join one of the two um, as as assessment and stabilization units, and then move on to a treatment unit. Once folks are ready to discharge, the whole time through, uh, our social workers are in connection with the home health authority, communicating with the team, coordinating things such as um, resources, um, trying to support the home health authority team to ensure housing and other supports. And often our clients return to rehab and recovery. Um, we have a program here called Coast Rehab and Recovery. So some of the clients, I think 10%, um, go and stay another six to 12 months um, at another site on the Simico LLMs, but the majority go back home to tertiary beds, ACT team, mental health team, and home, and, and or the regional uh, hospitals in the home health authorities. So if you have questions about flow and admissions and intakes, uh, you can let us know a bit. We're happy to share that information as well as our referral package. Um, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about kind of the psychosocial models and philosophies of care uh, that we provide and what kind of our work is grounded in and then building up from that what our groups, uh, et cetera, look like. We have uh, kind of six guiding principles and um, this is developed in our model of care. We have a, a model of care that outlines kind of what we do and why we do it. 
Um, and we have addressed, um, so, sorry, there's, there's a lot in this picture, um, but in the outer perimeter, these kind of words in the gray, those are kind of the values um, and philosophies that we work with, evidence-based and data-driven, family-centered, team-based, seamless and integrated, so kind of, yeah, holistic and integrated, uh, trauma-informed, culturally safe and humble, as well as recovery-oriented. And we have those in more detail defined and, uh, and how we've defined them and how we also then enact them. The words in the, the six green bubbles, these are actually the categories of care that we provide. And uh, we provide group programming, individualized programming, and of course, pharmacological programming that hopefully addresses at least one of these uh, six domains. But I will show you that our groups address physical wellness, mental wellness, um, substance-free living, so helping people towards uh, recovery and um, abstinence. Um, if that is uh, part of their plans, uh, addressing problem behaviors, uh, family and intimacy, so social communication and connectedness, as well as meaningful life. So we've structured our group therapies primarily, but also our medication therapies, et cetera, around these six um, kind of domains of care. Here is a snapshot of our group programming. We do run... Um, at least a dozen groups a day. Uh, I think on weekends, probably at least seven or eight groups a day. We are high, uh, and I think on average, our clients attend. Mm, the last research, the tally I did, I think our clients attend on average of fifteen groups a week. Um, our groups range from uh, thirty-minute check-in groups to hour and even two hour long groups that are more intensive, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, um, dialectical behavioral therapy, seeking safety. And you can see that we've divided some of our groups across our six domains that I've described. And this is a this is just a sample list. We are constantly evolving our groups. We are quite interdisciplinary. Of course, we have our docs and nurses. Uh, we also have psychologists, occupational therapists, social workers, art therapy, music therapy, rec therapy, indigenous care, spiritual care. Um, uh, I'm missing some, but we have a, a lot more as well of uh, physio, pharmacists. So we, we have a lot of people and everyone's got a hand in providing programming. And so this is a list of some of the groups that um, we have found to lead because um, plants can't sit in CBT groups all day. You also have to balance that out with other things such as um, music group or, or cooking group as well. So we have a well-rounded group. Um, we have a lot of groups, but motivation to engage in treatment obviously is also a barrier. So if you build the groups, how do we, how do we support people to come? Um, so we have kind of in, in the background, several initiatives to support motivation and support treatment engagement. So I'll describe a few of them. And uh, yeah, we can have more questions about it during the Q&A. Um, contingency management is actually one of the most well-supported interventions for concurrent disorders. Contingency management is based on principles of positive reinforcement. We have two, actually we have three, but I'll, I'll talk about two versions of that. Um, Voucher Village is based on continuous positive reinforcement. And it's quite simple. Every group that you go to, you earn a voucher. And uh, once a week, you get to tally up your vouchers and cash them in for bus tickets, um, chips. Um, what else do we have? Canned oysters are popular, um, batteries, uh, name brand toothpaste. So we actually check in with our clients every year what, they're, what they would like stocked at Voucher Village, and then we, we price them accordingly um, with vouchers, not cash. And then we also have a program called Fishbowl, which uh, is based on intermittent positive reinforcement. And basically, you reach into a literal fishbowl with cubes, like kind of like dice, and you pull out, and half of them say, good job. Half of, and then like a, a fraction of them will say small prize, medium prize, or large prize. And that's where we give out things like nice pillows, earphones. Um, so we're able to provide uh, comforts to support the fact that our clients are going through uh, really hard work of recovery. Um, also to help staff as well as clients keep organized with the you know dozens and dozens of groups that we have running, we have uh, initiated client calendars. So on Mondays, clients get blank calendars and then the master copy and they write down the groups that they wanna go to. And they also write down their passes, family visits, 
um, you know, trips out into the community, et cetera, as a form of kind of self-engagement. It's like your own timetable or um, kind of schedule for yourself. So these are just some of the uh, psychosocial interventions um, that, that we support. Um, sorry, uh, Arash, um, I just got a direct question. I don't know if you got it, but Bree was wondering, will these slides be um, shared with, with the audience later? We can do that as well. Perfect, okay, so thanks Bree for your question and yeah, um, and feel free to contact Nick or I if you have any uh, follow-up questions about this. Um, without further ado then, I'll pass this along to Nick uh, to talk um, about more about our clientele and our, our medical uh, interventions. Okay, let me just get set up here. Oops, sorry, thank you. Thanks Jane. Uh, so I'm going to move on and we're going to discuss um, who our patients are. So we try to obtain uh, some demographic information regarding our patients, as well as uh, different aspects of their medical status. So you guys can get an understanding of, of how complex the patients are that come to the Redfish Healing Center. Um, so we had demographics and the, the first thing that we looked at was ethnicity. And as you can see, uh, people of First Nations background are overrepresented in our population. So in, in the Canadian population, uh, First Nations peoples make up about 5% of the total population, and uh, it's about 26%. So a quarter of the patients that, that come through Redfish are of First Nations background. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. The other thing to note is how many, what percentage of our patients are um, single or, or divorced. Um, it, it shows the amount of social disconnection uh, that our patients have compared to, to the rest of the population. Um, so 71% of our, our patients are, are single, 13% are divorced. So if you look at people who, who are actually partnered, it's only about 11%. So about 89% of people don't have any sort of significant other. If we can move to the next slide. How about education? If you look at the general population in Canada, 73%, so almost three quarters of the entire population in Canada has some sort of post-secondary education. Uh, we are one of the most educated populations on planet Earth. But as you can see with our population, it, it, it falls far below what you would see in, in the general population in Canada. And it, it shows um, how far behind uh, people might be to gain the opportunities that the rest of us um, might be able to enjoy. Next slide. How about employment? If you look at the general population in Canada, about 61% of, of the population uh, is employed. Uh, whereas the vast majority of people, so only about 16% of the population at Redfish are, are employed or gain an income. Uh, everybody else is either unemployed or um, is, is retired or out of work um, and, and unable to work. If we can move to the next slide. The number one source of income for people in our population, it does come from, from disability and it shows uh, the severity of their substance use and, and their mental health issues and the impact that it has on their ability uh, to, to engage in, in income, gaining activity in society. Next slide, or next slide. How about housing? Um, very few of our population um, have market housing or own their own place. Um, with our population, most of the population has some sort of subsidized housing. 14% uh, um, would be unhoused, um, but, but the rest have some sort of subsidized housing. If we can move to the next slide. How about insight into mental illness? Overall, if you, if you look at all of the different um, mental health issues that people might have, uh, people tend to be pretty insightful as in terms of depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder. However, when it comes to personality disorders or psychotic disorders, people have very low insight. So if they have a personality disorder and they don't understand why people might be reacting the way they are to them, uh, they'll have a low insight into this. And, and it's the same with the psychotic disorder. When, when people have a psychotic disorder in our population, um, it, it's the small minority, about a third of the people who have a psychotic disorder actually know that they have one. 
If we can move to the next slide. How about chronic pain? Almost half of our patients have a chronic pain issue in our population. And uh, this actually lines up to what we see in the coroner's report back in 2017, uh, where they showed 58% uh, of the people who overdosed that year um, did experience or were suspected to experience uh, chronic pain. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. So with people who have chronic pain, the majority of them do take street drugs to help deal with this chronic pain. And this can lead to their increased risk of overdose in, in this population. Next slide. So what substances are, are people using? In our population, the number one substance is crystal meth, then alcohol. Now, it's interesting because our population, when they self-report, they, they say that they're using heroin. However, it is widely known that the, the most common street opioid out there is fentanyl. So even things sold as heroin uh, will, will likely be fentanyl. Next, uh, next slide. How about injection drug use? Um, so if, if you look at the people who use substances, the most common way of, of using the substances is actually by smoking, but still about a third are engaged in, um, in IV drug use. And uh, this can also lead to transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, uh, things like hepatitis. And, and so um, about a third of the population um, who are having sex are, are having sex without a condom. Next slide. How about overdoses? Um, so the vast majority, 60% of the people uh, at Redfish have overdosed. And if you take the people who have overdosed, they've had seven and a half overdoses on average. So there's a high amount of overdoses, and the rule is repeat overdoses over time. Next slide. How about legal history? Um, so when you look at people who have a legal history at Redfish, um, the majority have engaged in violence. And if you take the people who have um, who have a history of physical uh, um, violence, they are likely to report violence towards other people. So the amount of people who have been violent towards other people are overrepresented in this population of um, severely mentally ill and severe substance use disorder population. Next slide. How about violence towards self? Um, the, the vast majority have had suicide attempts and, and um, about a quarter of them have self-harmed. So th there's a large overrepresentation of suicide and self-harm within our population. Next slide. How about tri childhood trauma? One thing that is often overlooked is one of the most common issues with childhood trauma is physical neglect. So a lot of our patients come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds where you might have um, one or both parents um, or if, if they have both parents working and, and unable to be around and, and support uh, the, the, their children. And so this is one of the most common types of severe trauma found within our population of redfish. Next slide. So if you look, um, Physical neglect seems to be the, the most common uh, type of traumatic experience um, that our patients will self-report on the childhood trauma questionnaire. Next slide. So what about service satisfaction? So if you take our population, um, most of the population, so about 60 to, to 75% of the population, um, have reported that they are better able to deal with crisis, uh, their symptoms are not bothering them as much. The medications that they're taking are controlling their symptoms. Uh, they do better in social situations, and they deal more effectively with daily problems. Um, so uh, this is a population where they have failed every addiction treatment program and every psychiatric program in their home health authority. And when they come here, from their own self-report, they are reporting that they are getting benefits in those domains after receiving treatment at Redfish. Uh, next slide. And um, so this is uh, this is looking at service satisfaction. 
Um, so the, again, the vast majority of people, so 50 to 75 percent of, of people um, felt that they were treated with dignity, that they felt their hospital stay was necessary, that the surroundings and atmosphere uh, helped them get better, they felt safe, uh, the hospital environment was clean and comfortable, uh, their contact with their doctor was helpful, their <clears throat> contact with nurses and therapists were um, helpful, and uh, they would choose this hospital again if, if they had a, a chance. Um, Next slide. So this is a, a map of the patient journey. It's a very busy slide, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to cover it as quickly as possible. So um, in the pre-intake, uh, we gather the information. Then once they have met the criteria for redfish, then they come in and they're initially stabilized. So imagine a patient who has schizophrenia, crystal meth use, and they also use fentanyl. So when they come into the initial stabilization period, which is four to eight weeks, we would treat their uh, psychosis with antipsychotic medications. Um, if they're having withdrawal from crystal meth, we might use something like Seroquel. Um, and also we'd get them on opioid agonist therapy if they were using um, fentanyl. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them into a period of abstinence uh, from substance use um, and make sure that they don't have psychotic symptoms at the time and make sure that they're um, able to take care of themselves as, as far as they're functioning. Once they're stabilized from their acute symptoms, then they go into the uh, integrated individualized treatment and recovery program, which is on average 12 to 16 weeks. And this, as Jane mentioned, and I, I won't mention this earlier uh, again, but um, we try to treat their psychosis, their addiction, their physical health, their um, activities of daily living, and engage them in meaningful activities. And then they are discharged back to their home communities. Uh, so the metrics that we use um, for success are we look for early remission, according to the DSM. So we're looking for three months of abstinence. We're looking for an 80% reduction in their um, addiction severity index score and a decrease in their HONO score. So uh, if we can move to the next slide. We also have one for uh, affective disorder, so people with depression or bipolar disorder. I won't go into detail about this. If we can move to the next slide. We also have one for people with cognitive impairments. So if you look at the hotel study, what they found was that uh, of the people in the downtown east side, 45% of them uh, had had evidence of a traumatic brain injury that could be diagnosed on neuroimaging. So there's a, a proportion of our population that meet our mandate that come in uh, that might need more simplified or shorter groups uh, to help engage them in, into treatment. Um, if we can move to the next slide. So why is our program six to nine months long? Well, let's look at hallucinations. How long does it take on average for first episode psychosis? Uh, to, to reach remission. Uh, for hallucinations, on average, it's 27 days, and for delusions, it's 76 days. Oftentimes, it's longer for our patients because these aren't first episode psychosis patients. These are people with often more chronic psychotic disorders. Next slide. Then there's the issue of protracted withdrawal. In the treatment community, it's often called um, post-acute withdrawal syndrome, um, but these are uh, symptoms that occur due to uh, continued use of substances and brain changes. So I'll make a tangential example, and then I'll, I'll bring it back. So imagine astronauts going up into space. They lose um, bone and muscle mass. Um, why? Because your body's saying, well, why do I need all this bone and muscle if I don't have all this gravity to fight against? In the same way, when you stimulate your nucleus accumbens, the reward center in your brain to levels not found in nature, your body says, why do I need all these dopamine receptors? So you lose dopamine receptors in your brain in places like the nucleus accumbens. And as a result, uh, you get symptoms from that. If we can move to the next slide. So uh, for instance, for alcohol, um, the acute withdrawal phase is usually around seven days. Um, what you find with post-acute withdrawal is that the symptoms are worse three to six months into recovery. So one thing I always hear from my patients is, doc, I stopped using, why don't I feel better? Um, and, and the reason is, is post-acute withdrawal. Um, so you have dopamine receptors in your orbitofrontal cortex. That's the part that helps you concentrate. So people will have difficulty concentrating. They might not feel depressed, but they have this sort of blasé feeling uh, or what we call anhedonia, where they might not feel pleasure from activities. And that's because there's less dopamine receptors in your reward pathway in your nucleus accumbens. You can also have issues with sleep 18 to 24 months out. Uh, next slide. So you don't start getting recovery until about eight to 10 months. 
um, after uh, of abstinence from the substance. And you don't get back to your pre-morbid level of functioning until about 18 to 24 months uh, after your last use of substances. So the, the time for recovery is months to years, not days to weeks or, or simply months. Um, next slide. So the stuff I talked about, is this something theoretical or is this something that we can see? Well, these are images from um, functional MRIs. And where you see the red is higher dopaminergic activity. So the, the image that you see in the middle is uh, the dopaminergic activity in someone's brain one month into recovery. As you can see, it's much lower than the healthy control. In 14 months into abstinence, you get uh, near full recovery back to your pre-morbid level of functioning. Um, with abstinence from, from, in this case, methamphetamine. So there is a hope for recovery. It is something that can be done, uh, but it is something that takes time. And that's what we hope to deliver at Redfish Healing Center is uh, time and holistic treatment for our patients. And I think that's all the slides that I had. And uh, we're open to questions.